Thank you. Thank you, Vitaly. Um, so, as Vitaly said, my name is Anna Miguez, and I work as a front-end developer and designer at Lunar Logic. This is a very special software house based in Krakow. And as of beginning of the year, I am also a Google developer expert uh, in the area of web technologies. The title of my talk is Fast But Not Furious, Debugging User Interaction Performance Issues. Um, during the past few years, as Vitaly mentioned, I had a chance to build and maintain a free open source libraries for animations. And while building them, I really wanted to focus on making them accessible, making them performant. So I must say that I'm quite up to date when it comes to performance. And well, I, I saw one term emerging recently, and this term is perceived performance. And while there is no one definition, if you search for perceived performance uh, in regard of web technologies, uh, you probably would uh, associate this term with things like first meaningful paint and time to interactive. First meaningful paint means that you want to show the user something as fast as possible, paint some, something to screen as fast as possible, and time to interactive means that you want the user to be able to interact with what's painted to the screen as fast as possible. And if you searched further, you would find things like how to optimize critical path, which means how to get a piece of code that is needed to, to show something above the fault to the user. Or even things about how to fake performance, fake loading performance, like how to use progress bars instead of spinners, because then users think that something is going on faster, that something is loading faster or how uh, to have placeholder content. So this is something that, uh, I don't know if you use Facebook here, but you have these gray boxes instead of content that just show user that something is going to show up any second uh, on the website. Or even starting to upload a file before user even knows they want to upload it. Like wh when they choose photo in the gallery uh, of their device, it starts being uploaded without them even hitting upload. So I must say I don't really um, agree with what we call perceived performance now. Uh, I feel that this is more about faking things, and I, I wish we were doing things that are really our performance. And to, to make it easier for you to understand why I don't agree with this, I'll tell you a short story from my life. Um, last year, I had a chance to fulfill one of my biggest dreams, uh, to reach the sacred valley of Machu Picchu in Peru after a few days of trekking. Unfortunately, on the first day, I fell very ill of the altitude sickness, and it was obvious that on the second day, I won't be able to uh, go up the mountain uh, on my own. I was just too weak. So my alternative was either to go um, either to go uh, to, to the city and wait for the rest of the trip to reach the valley of Machu Picchu, and I would go there by train after a few days, or I could take a horse up the mountain uh, instead of walking. So, of course, I decided on a horse. So I rode on a horseback to the top of the Salcantay Pass, and it turned out there was nothing there. It was snowy, it was terrible, it was horribly... Uh, horribly empty, no one, like next to no one was there, and the rest of my crew was about to go there in 40 minutes, that's what I was told. So there was no way I was able to stand there for 40 minutes. And it didn't matter to me that I got fast to the summit, like it didn't make any sense to me, because like what's, what was lying there was quite horrible, to be honest. So I feel that this is something that we see with perceived performance now, like what we, what we call perceived performance now is like per perceived load performance. We just ship things fast and then we don't care about the user. We don't care what happens to the user once the content is loaded. And while uh, perceived load performance is fine, I wish that user was happy at all times, not only when the page is loading. So what I would like us to call perceived performance is not only first meaningful paint and time to interactive, it's also about having the website smooth at all times. So this is what we're going to try to focus on today. 
So the agenda is, I'll tell you why sometimes some things uh, feel, um, feel slow, about the browser rendering process and what the frame consists of, about tr types of trigger changes in the UI, how to test if we have interaction performance issues, and about some UI patterns that, are, um, that can be deadly to our performance. So why sometimes interactions feel slow? The reason is junk. I know that you probably love Comic Sans. Um, so junk can be basically um, described as a lack of smoothness. It happens when the browser refresh rate doesn't hit the refresh rate of our screen, of our device. So possibly you can uh, easy, uh, easily spot it when, when you're running some animation that is not optimized. Um, so let's say that the refresh rate of our screen is 60 frames per second. This means that one, one second is 1,000 milliseconds, and if we divide it by 60, then we have 16 uh, milliseconds for one frame. This is not very much time, to be honest, for the browser to create a frame. So, but is it 60? Now there are some devices that are starting to have 120 frames per second, uh, namely new iPads Pro and uh, Razer gaming smartphones. This means that we have half the budget uh, that we used to have before. And I'm not trying to say that everyone needs to support this, uh, these devices because they are quite niche now, but uh, we might be facing some kind of revolution soon. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to say that it's sure, but with retina screens and high pixel density screens, we also had a few devices at the beginning. And only then, the, uh, all devices started to have higher pixel density. So what is actually very popular in gaming industry for gaming developers is working in between the frames, making, um, making it less work for the browser, just offloading the browser from, from doing too many things. And us as web developers, we don't care enough about this yet. We don't know much about this yet. And I'll try to help you a bit with knowing what to do. So how can we actually help the browser to make, it on, to make it on time, to deliver this frame for the 16 milliseconds or maybe 8 milliseconds budget? The one thing we can do is to offload the main thread. So at, to simplify, at one thread, one action can happen in, at one time. And the JavaScript is usually at the beginning of the frame. Um, so if we have like really heavy JavaScript calculations, it will delay loading of the rest of the UI. Um, and on the main thread, we have UI and the DOM. But there is also a background thread for really heavy tasks. So for example, if you go to the page and it's not fully loaded yet, you can still scroll smoothly. You can still scroll and you'll see some, some things loading. This is because scrolling is on the background thread. This is a really important task, so browser vendors decided to move it to another thread. So we can actually uh, take use of that and use web workers to put some things on the, on the background thread. This means that if we have some uh, heavy calculation to be done, this is something that you should go to the background thread. Unfortunately, any DOM, any DOM or any UI thing can't be done on the background thread. We have to do it on the main thread, but we can optimize the main thread. So this is something we're going to talk about now. So the bottom line is, if we interact with page in any way, hovering, scrolling, clicking elements, the browser needs to start serving frames to us because something changed. Like each like image, each frame needs to be served to us, be it 16, 60 or 120 frames per second. But what a frame consists of? So a typical frame consists of JavaScript. We also have a recalculation of styles, layout, paint, and compositing layers. So this doesn't tell us much about what's happening there. So let's go, so let's go through all the steps and figure out what the browser is doing during these steps. So during the first step, change happens and an event is fired. It doesn't have to be JavaScript, it's just here for simplification. It can be, for example, hovering or scrolling. After that, according to this change, some styles need to be rec recalculated because something changed on the page. And this styles recalculation sometimes means that the layout needs to be recalculated. 
At this point, the browser is trying to figure out how much space each element is going to take, where it's going to be positioned. So it's about creating vector boxes that represent geometry of the page. After we have layout step done, then everything is rasterized and everything is painted to the layers at the paint stage. Uh, so basically, browser takes these uh, takes vectors, vector boxes that we had, and it paints them to pixels. It paints them to layers. By default, browser makes one layer for every uh, for for the whole page. But there are certain uh, certain things that make browser to think that some things needs to be on another layer. You can think of layers as of layers in Photoshop. If you have two things on one layer, they're glued together, and there is not much you can do about them. Like, they're just stick together. But if you have one thing on one layer and another thing on another layer, you can just move things around, and they're not going to affect each other. This is great, for example, for animation. So, as I said, by default, we have one layer. But what creates another layers? So, these are, this is a list of things. Uh, first, th there are 3D or perspective transforms. 2D transforms and opacity, but they have to be animated to, to create another layer. There is also a uh, uh, thing when we have elements as a, on the top of another layer or as, as a child of another layer. This also makes, uh, creates another layer. If we use accelerated CSS filters, in some special cases, canvas, video, plugins like Silverlight or Flash, this is because the browser knows that this area is going to be changed a lot. Like if we are having some video, probably this part of the screen is going to, to be changed. So we want to create another context for that. We don't want it to affect the rest of the page. And there is one thing that lets us explicitly say that this part of pa page probably is going to be changed. I think it should be another layer. I think it needs a new context. And this is the will change CSS property. Using this uh, property is, uh, is quite straightforward. So we have our element, and we need to tell upfront what is going to be changed. So in this case, if you wanted to change uh, a scale of a button on hover, we need to tell that upfront that this button is going to be changed. Because if we set the wheel change property uh, on hovering, the browser is already trying to do what it can to, to make the layer as fast as possible. So you need to remember to put it up front and tell which property is going to be changed. But you should remember that every layer consumes memory, and you should use them wisely. So if we have too many layers for some less fortunate users with older uh, smartphones, older, uh, older computers, the browser can crash. It can be actually, um, it can actually set them back. So, so you should always test how it behaves in some less powerful devices. And then the last step is compositing. Compositing happens always if you have more than one layer. Basically, what it means is like we have our layers from the paint stage, and they are just glued together to show one frame to the user. This is the image that is going to be uh, sh shown to, to the user in the browser. Uh, the funny thing about compositing is the first step that is happening uh, on the GPU, not the CPU. So we are actually offloading. Uh, our, uh, our user's com computer or device. Um, so as I said, this was a typical frame. But the frame doesn't always have to look like that. There are just different types of triggered changes that um, actually can, uh, can be less or more performance. So let's talk about it now. First type of change is the reflow. This is the layout change that happens when we change uh, properties like width or height, display, margins, anything that changes the geometry of the page and positions of elements. In this type of change, all of the, uh, all of the mentioned steps need to go through, because if we change layout, then it's, the page needs to get repainted, and then we have to have compositing. This is a very heavy type of change, and it should be avoided um, at any cost. Then the next type of change is a paint change, also called repaint. So uh, this happens when we change properties like background color, color, background image, box shadow. Uh, at this point, browser knows exactly how much space each element is going to take, so it doesn't need to go through the layout step. So we can skip this one. 
and we can uh, already go to paint stage and then to compositing. This is a bit uh, less heavy change, but sometimes uh, painting can be the most expensive task in the pipeline, so we should also avoid it if it's possible. And then the last type of change is compositing stage, uh, compositing change, and it happens when we change properties like opacity and transforms. This is very powerful and uh, very uh, lightweight change, and this is what we should be using, for example, for animations or for, for, for some changes that happen when we interact with the page. Because compositing is going to happen anyway, and this type of change is happening at the CPU at the last step. So this is the type of change that we should be striving for. And transforms give us a lot of options there. We can really do almost anything with them. So we know, we know what, what browser does to serve some frames, but how to actually test if we have a problem with some reflows or repaints? Reflows are pretty easy to spot. If you are changing the size uh, of the elements, changing its position, or if the, this element is going to push another element somewhere else, it's probably a reflow. And while reflows can be pretty obvious to spot, they, they can like really be visible with bare eye because um, like some weird things can happen, the repaints are not that obvious. For them, we might need a better tools. For example, at this uh, slide, the repaints would happen if you, um, if you tried stars one to four, but the last star in each row didn't cause a repaint. And I found it out only because of dev tools. This was happening because the, um, the text was uh, over the, uh, apparently over this uh, pseudo element. So what tools can we use? The first one uh, that you should turn to is a performance tab, either in Chrome or in Firefox. In this tab, you can record the page and record how the interaction is happening. So you do it by clicking this, uh, this uh, dot in the le uh, top left corner and start interacting with the page. The shorter the recording, the better. It's easier to debug. Then as this, uh, you see these green boxes, and it's how much the frame is, is taking, how long that frame took. So if you click on it, you'll see each, each stage from the frame, and it will show you uh, like what, what took the longest. And this is something that should probably debug. Um, then there is the layer tab in Chrome. This is a really great tool. Uh, you can enable it by going to More Tools in Chrome and then uh, Layer tab. Um, and it will show you how, how, how all the layers are behaving in, uh, in real time. If you interact with the page, it will show you where the layers are created. Also, on the left, you can click on each layer and the uh, browser will tell you why the layer was created, what was the reason of creating it. Unfortunately, this tool is quite heavy. Um, I had trouble to record the, the GIF for you here. So, Thankfully, there is a bit uh, less uh, heavy tool, which is the rendering tab in Chrome, which is enabled in the same way. Here you can also see the, the layers borders. You can see the paint flashing. There is also a um, thing like FPS meter, which will tell you how many frames per second you're hitting, which is uh, really cool to debug animations. Also, uh, it will tell you if you have any scrolling performance issues. So if you enabled this tab and uh, enabled FPS meters and, uh, and paint flashing, this is what it would look like. This is just scrolling Facebook. You can see with these uh, green areas how many things are repainted every time you interact with the page, how, um, how unoptimized it can be. But also, you should actually test paint flashing also in Firefox. Uh, you can do it by going to the settings tab and uh, enabling toggle paint flashing. Um, you should actually do it because um, so, some interactions happen differently in Chrome and Firefox. This is an implementation feature. And for example, if you scroll Facebook uh, on, on, on Firefox, you can accidentally trigger some hovers, which really makes the, the page more junky, which doesn't happen in Chrome. So you should probably test in both tools. Um, and the last but not least is performance monitor tab in Chrome. Uh, you can just enable it and uh, try to interact with the page. If you have uh, 
under 20% of CPU usage, you're probably good. If you don't have any reflows, this is also great. You should have hardly any repaints uh, shown on the left. Uh, but if you have more, this is probably something you can work on. Uh, for example, if I, I was trying an, uh, some page that was not optimized, it was taking around 90% of CPU. So this is something you shouldn't strive for. You should strive for a few percent here. Um, so we know how to test. But there are some potentially dangerous UI features that we're, like, we're all using these patterns because this is something that, that just people do. But if we don't think about them enough, sometimes they can be potentially dangerous for our performance. So what, what features are these? So first thing we should turn to is animations. If you have animation that is not optimized, it will be visible with bare eye. You'll see the junk as you saw on the GIF from, uh, from before. So how can you fight it? Just don't overuse animations. Don't throw them in if you don't have to, because they're quite heavy for the performance. Um, try to animate only transform and opacity. Um, as I said before, these are the, the most optimal changes that you can do. If you want to animate uh, for 120 frames per second for these new devices, or maybe for the future, you should actually avoid uh, request animation frame. Uh, you should turn to CSS animation in such case. Uh, the reason is because some of the browsers, like Mobile Safari namely, uh, have the cap of 60 frames per second. Like they, they say, they, they don't detect the um, device refresh rate, they just set 60 frames per second. And it's probably not going to change because of the backwards compatibility. So even if you have request animation frame, it won't hit 120 frames per second. It will be just 60 frames per second tops. Uh, also, don't animate elements below other nodes, like below uh, fixed headers or below any other elements, because it will promote this element to another layer, or probably something, something weird can happen there uh, when it's going to be uh, going on. And don't animate too many elements, like one or two nodes is OK. But if you want to, uh, for example, have a beautiful um, I don't know, snow falling animation on your, on your website. Don't use 100 divs. You can do it with one and box shadow. Just try to do some tricks around it. Just don't animate too many elements. Um, the next thing is my favorite thing. It's parallax effect. Um, so I tried to find a demo for like optimized parallax, parallax effect. I tried to find if there is a way to make it uh, performing well, so this is what I found. It was told, like it was saying that this is the most optimal way to do parallax. It's like fast parallax, but it, as you can see, it's causing paint storms. So paint storm is when with each frame you have to repaint the whole browser window. This is the way, way it's all in green. So this is not very performant, as you can see. So for parallax effect, better not to use it if you don't have to. It causes paint storms. Definitely don't hook to the scroll events for parallax event. And try to not use background position also for parallax effect. If you want to make parallax effect, you should actually use uh, 3D transforms and perspective uh, technique. And if you, if you need to, there is a link. I'll post the slides later. The next thing is fixed elements. Like, who has a fixed element on their page? Yeah, like literally half of you. So uh, what the browser needs to do with fixed elements that are unoptimized, it needs to like create uh, a, an image, a frame of this element on each other frame. So there is quite easy fix to that. We should just add a will change property to the fixed elements if we have them. Of course, we shouldn't have too many fixed elements uh, on the page, but one or two should be OK if we add it uh, will change with transform to them. Or we can also turn to translate 3D. Uh, it doesn't move element anywhere. Uh, it, it's just a trick that also creates another layer. As I said before, uh, 3D transforms also creates other layers. Uh, scrolling events. Uh, you probably know that s hooking to scrolling events is not very performant usually. Um, so 
what, what we do here, we shouldn't rather attach wheel or attach listeners to the whole document, to the whole page. It's rather not for performing very well. If we, if we want to attach uh, some, some uh, uh, scrolling events, we should uh, try to use passive event listeners. But use polyfill because otherwise it can uh, it can have some unexpected results on some other older older browsers. So what it does is just a flag at the end of adding even listener, and what it does it says like I'm never going to use prevent default in this function because otherwise browser has this scrolling event and it all the like even though you don't call prevent default. The browser all the time is, uh, is anticipating, like maybe the prevent default will be called. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should be prepared for that. And sometimes scrolling can be janky because of that. But if we pass uh, uh, this passive true, uh, even listener uh, flag, then we should be good to go because browser will know that the prevent default will won't be called in this. Um, Hover effects. Usually they're quite fine to use. You shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't really be bothered by this. But as I said, some, sometimes, um, for example, in, Firefo in Firefox, uh, so, some things can be triggered by accident when you're scrolling, and it can make the performance worse. So what we, we, what we should do is to rather try to, uh, if, if they're bound to happen often, if you know that something is going to, to be triggered many times by hovering, you might consider adding the will change property there. But you should test if it's not going to make things worse. Also, it can be deadly if there are like too many uh, things that can be easily triggered by hovering. So you should actually avoid uh, putting, for example, big blocks that can be hovered and that some animation or some effect is happening. If there, uh, if if user scrolls through them, it shouldn't be like easily triggered. You should avoid putting like big blocks that change on hover. And. Um, if, if, you, if you're doing some hover effects, try to also use uh, uh, try to use transforms in opacity and avoid uh, effects that trigger uh, reflow or repaint. And there is a great link with CSS triggers, which shows uh, what each property is going to, to change for the user when it's triggered. And last but not least is appending elements. We all do append elements to our website, or we all remove our uh, elements on our websites. But you should remember that um, this, this means that uh, the whole context to the bottom from the place where, where the layout was altered is going to be repainted or reflown. So as you can see, here we are just triggering a, um, a, a repaint on the whole page, bottom down, from from the element that uh, that is appended there, and uh, it can be easily um, avoided. Maybe not that easily, but it can be avoided. Uh, for starters, we should make sure that we don't affect many elements if we are appending something. Uh, the second thing is that we can try to separate the area that is going to be affected. Can, it can be done with, again, will change property. We can just have another layer for, for that is going to, to get reflows and repaints. Or also we could use contain layout, but the support is not great yet. I'm hoping it's going to be better because um, if we could use contain layout, it means that anything that happens inside this, uh, this layer um, this layer is not going to affect the things outside, and things from the outside are not going to affect this context. Also, we could uh, try not to change the size of the area, like try not to push things down and have uh, overflow property on this area along with the wheel change. This might, uh, this might be a uh, help for, for our uh, reflows here. So, to sum up, the junk happens if the uh, browser doesn't, uh, doesn't match the refresh rate of our, of our screens uh, if the frames are not served uh, within the deadline. We should try to offload and optimize the main thread. Try not to have reflows or repaint if they're not really needed on our page. But at the same time, we shouldn't overuse layers. Um, 
always try to test your website with, uh, with all dimension tools, performance tab, layers tab, rendering tab, um, performance monitor. Try to make sure that you're not making performance worse because of the micro-optimizations. And try to use responsibly potentially dangerous UI patterns. Please don't use parallax effect if you can. Um, there is a list of resources I have. Uh, they're all like really eye-opening when once you start digging into it. Probably there's way more that I should uh, that I should post here, but uh, you can always hit me if you need some help. And thank you, Spasiba. All right. Well done, Anna. Would you like to join me for a little yeah, conversation? Sure. I think we have some hungry people here. Anybody <laughs> hungry? Oh, now that now they're living. Yeah, let's um, make it brief. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you so much for such a packed uh, talk with all kind of practical techniques, a lot of stuff. That's uh, really, really great, wonderful. Um, I have a question though. I mean, even if we all spend a lot of time and effort doing all this stuff on our site, in the end, we end up adding wonderful, shiny, beautiful ad tracking scripts and third-party scripts and tracking pixels and, God forbid. I don't know, A-B testing maybe and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And in the end, we have essentially tons of uh, scroll events happening. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to apply this kind of concept in a way, all those, those techniques reliably for third-party scripts as well? Can we tame them? Um, to be honest, I have no idea. I think we should try to tame the people who want to add all these tracking scripts, maybe. Like, be responsible about how many things we're, we're putting in our page. Uh, like, try not to overuse uh, all the, like, plugins and yeah. third-party things. Um, probably, like, I don't know any good technique of appending this thing so that it would not break the performance, to be honest. Yeah, because whenever you add those wonderful tech managers, it's like inviting friends to trash your apartment. Yeah. And they bring friends <laughs> that they know and that we don't know. Yeah. And it keeps going. It just, we have this performance effort very often and then, then it gets ruined. Um, but do you think that there is also a thing that's uh, something like being too fast, where people don't realize that something changed or something has just happened so quickly that you don't realize well, we need to slow them down. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, uh, like if we have uh, single page apps, I think the change might not be noticed by some users. So sometimes adding some like little spinner or a little progress bar that will just go really quickly might be a good hint for them to, to see that something was changed. Uh, or I don't know, just just adding some highlight to the area that was changed, but it's not uh, probably a very often case. Right. And the last one, maybe, when it comes to metrics, so you mentioned a few things in Time to Interactive mm -hmm. and so on. Is there a way to reliably measure the overall um, kind of rendering performance? I mean, we, can, we need to hit 60 frames per second, but at some point, Google started talking about hitting 90 frames per second, was it? 120. 120. Uh, that can be difficult, I guess, mm -hmm. and you can't permanently like keep it. Mm -hmm. So what is good enough? Um, you, I mean, is it mm -hmm. recommended to just keep to 60 at least and be you know, consistent about that and so be very kind of uh, strategic about that? Or 50 is okay-ish? Well, it's okay. -ish. It feels a bit sluggish, but uh, 60 can be easily hit if we use uh, transforms and passive for our animations. Use, like usually, it should be enough. Uh, if we have 60 frames per second on 120 frames per second device, it should be just twice as fast. It's it's um, yeah, it's going on faster than. Okay, so overall fast but not furious. Yes. <laughs> All right. So this is mine. Thank you so much, Anna, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. You. Really well done. Thank you. Thank you.